able to touch base here. How in the world have you been? I've been great. How you been doing? Well, you know, when you get to be my age, you just go go from one day to the next, and you you hope you can get there. <laughs> but uh, I remember when you were here, somebody we were talking about you being on. Uh, we we did several post games back in the day when you played here back in eighty seven, mm-hmm. I guess. Uh, eighty eight. Yeah, and and we had some good times there during that yes, uh, during did. that period, didn't we? Yes, we did. There were some good players on that team. You know, I didn't realize till I was just looking at the roster. That I, and we're going to be all over the place here, but I didn't realize that was Richard Dumas's first year at Oklahoma State. Yeah, it was his uh, freshman year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a chance to uh, play uh, the pickup game with him when he was in high school at Booker T. Washington. And I uh, was like, you know, just, you know, I was out of college, but uh, uh, in between junior college, I should say. But uh, I was uh, I played against him uh, at Booker T. Coach uh, Harris used to bring mm-hmm. uh, former players to come in and and uh, scrimmage against uh, his high school team. So he wanted them to play against older guys. So. Uh, I was like, man, it's a talented kid. Yeah, you could tell right off the bat he was something special. And and quite frankly, uh, don't want to embarrass you, but that, that was the word we got when, uh, and I believe it was Ken Tricky who kind of uh, called uh, uh, Hamilton and said, you know, you got you to take a look at this guy here, this guy Starks. He can play, mm-hmm. and I'll be darned if he wasn't right. <laughs> yeah, Coach Tricky uh, definitely uh, – he was a character, uh, to say the least, uh, but a great man and a great coach. Uh, you know, he really gave me some inspiration uh, when I was uh, playing for him and told me that I had the skills uh, to go play for the, at the next level, and that really pushed me a lot. You know, you – I don't know of anybody I ever talked to, uh, either past or present, that – especially when we're talking basketball – has been just about on every – level of basketball that you could possibly come up with starting when you're in high school obviously we're talking about being there at central and then working Mm -hmm. your way all the way up to a nice 13-year career in the nba i mean junior colleges cba minor league uh teams in in the color in the nba world of basketball you have Mm -hmm. been on about every level you could possibly be yeah that's you know some guys have to go that that route, you know. It's, it's a few guys that went that route and went on to be successful in the NBA, and uh, obviously I was one of them. You know, just kept, uh, you know, staying focused and kept pushing uh, to get better as a player and, uh, you know, work on my craft and just had that uh, mentality that, you know, that I was going to get back up there. Obviously, I started off with uh, the Golden State Warriors, and then went down to the to the CBA and the World Basketball League. But I always was optimistic about you know my chances of get back, and uh, and it paid off for me. You were about as fierce a competitor as we've ever had here at Oklahoma State. Now I say this not because you're on, because I've said it in years past. Uh, I never saw John Starks back down from a challenge at all. Which takes me to the last chance, or the last dance, I mean, and Michael okay. Jordan and and the hookups that you guys had there. What was like you, for you watching that last dance and kind of reliving some of those moments? Yeah, it brought back a lot of fond memories. Uh, you know, competing against Michael and the Chicago Bulls, uh, the intensity uh, of that uh, of those battles was just incredible, uh, as you saw on the last dance. Um, you know, we was a team that was built on uh, defense, and they was a team more built on offense. Uh, and so it was just the clash of two different styles. Uh, obviously, we had one of the greatest low post players in the game, and Patrick Ewing, and me at the shooting guard, Oak at the power forward. You know, Anthony Mason and, and Derek Harper. Uh, but it, it was just a lot of fun uh, just playing. Uh, back there in the 90s and, and battling not just only Chicago but Indiana, Miami, all those teams back then because back then it was more about defense than anything. You know, Like I said, Chicago was built mainly for the offense and they had obviously a superior offensive player and uh, Michael Jordan who we had to contend with night in and night out. And Scotty, though, was the X factor on that team for the most part. You know, when he played, bad 
we end up beating them quite a bit. And uh, when he played well, they end up beating us. And so uh, we knew that Michael was just going to do, you know, be Michael. You know, you, you're not stopping him. Only thing you can hope for that you just can contain him and and hope that he's off that night. But Scotty was the guy who we try to focus our attention on and get him off his game. You know, you guys had great players as well, uh, but did the adrenaline start flowing a little bit more when Jordan walked on the court and you knew you were going against that guy that night? Oh, no question. It started the night before. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you have a lot of sleepless nights knowing that you got him coming into town <laughs> uh, and uh, knowing uh, the type of game that he's going to bring and knowing the type of game that you have to bring in order to compete with him. Um uh, you know, especially after he came back uh, when he retired and came back. Uh, I can remember the game vividly. He hit the game-winning shot uh, as the, the buzzer beater against Atlanta Hawks down in Atlanta, and he was coming coming our way next, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> it looked like he didn't get his game back together. And uh, he, he actually came in and gave us 55 points that particular night. Oh, jeez. It's almost commonplace for him, I think, back in the day, though. Uh, yeah. What was what was he like? And I don't know how much you had to do with him off the mm-hmm. court, but what was he like when he wasn't dribbling and shooting and defending? He, he was an incredible person. You know, I, I really got to know him over the years uh, after the game, you know, after we retired. And uh, just an incredible uh, person, you know, real humble dude. You know, uh, probably people looked at him on that, that – uh, uh, last dance and thought he was very arrogant, but he he was the reverse of that. And uh, just a special individual, you know what I mean? He, you saw the passion and how he cared about, about the game of basketball. And, uh, you know, you saw that come through. You know, I, I can remember one scene in there where they had to take a break because he teared up when mm-hmm. he, uh, he was talking about, you know, his passion and, and his love for the game. And I think uh, that probably uh, took him back is that people misunderstood his drive and what made him great. And most great players are like that. You know what I mean? You, you, they have a misunderstanding from the public. Uh, but you could tell with him, he really felt that people misunderstood, you know, what made him great and how he tried to, you know, wheel his team to uh, come up to his level. And uh, he did that successfully. Did you guys ever have any kind of uh, private conversations on the court, you know, a little trash going here and there uh, because you both were so no, competitive? You, <laughs> no, you know, to be honest with you, uh, I, I didn't make that mistake like a <laughs> lot of guys have, uh, talking noise to him because uh, he's the last person you want to talk noise to. <laughs> you know, he he's already going to come to play, and all you're doing is taking him and, and, and fueling the fire and uh, taking him to another level, so. We never did get into any trash talking. Uh, the only thing that he ever said to me was the first time that uh, I came off RR my uh, first season with the Knicks is, you know, I tried, he tried to post me up and I kind of elbowed him in his back and he looked at me and said, you're going to be calling me Mr. Jordan for the night is up. <laughs> you know, other than that, you know, he really didn't talk noise because he was so focused on what he had to do out there on the court. So he really didn't get into that. But if you start – you know, talking to him, then, you know, you're going to get the best out of him. And we all seen when you get the best out of him, what, what he can do. A couple of great stories that include John Starks uh, and your 13-year NBA career, incidentally, having scored almost 11,000 points over your career. Uh, most of those spent with the Knicks uh, back in the day. Had nice numbers career-wise, you know, over 12 mm-hmm. points a game and assists, which you were a big guy here, assist-wise. Mm-hmm. But... Tell me the story, A, about when maybe an injury turned out to be a good omen for you because the Knicks kept you on. Tell me that first story there. We'll get into story number two, which is the dunk in a okay. minute. Well, it, it was the last day of training camp, uh, and, and I'm trying to make uh, the Knicks roster. And, and, you know, I woke up that morning, and, you know, I had a great, you know, uh, preseason veteran camp. And, you know, it was just up in the air because, you know, at the position that I played was the two guard at that time, and they had Trent Tucker and Gerald Wilkins, and and so uh, I w- 
wasn't sure if they were going to keep me or not. So I I looked looked at that particular practice, that last practice as, as a playoff game. And so I came in focused as ever and came in, got off to a hot start. I don't think I even missed a shot that particular practice. And I saw an opportunity to really impress the coaches. And it was a fast break and Patrick coming down on my left side and I was coming on my right and I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm getting ready to show them that I want I want to stay here. And I uh, tried to go up and dunk on Patrick Ewing. And at that time, I forgot he, he can run and jump uh, pretty high to be a seven-footer. <laughs> and uh, he ended up catching my dunk. I came down and, and twisted my knee. And uh, and uh, so they had to put me on IR. At that time, I didn't know if they put you on IR is that they couldn't cut you. And so um, – it gave me a chance to stick around and probably around by December, you know, I was, I was getting antsy and I wanted to come out for IR and, uh, the guys, the players kept telling me, man, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Uh, just wait, wait to, uh, you know, your money is guaranteed. So there's a certain date where they have to guarantee all your money. And I said, no, I'm going there and tell them. So happens. Trent Tucker ended up getting hurt. Uh, that particular game right before I was getting ready to tell them to either take me off IR or, or let me go. And uh, so it gave me a chance to come on, and my first game was against Michael Jordan. Oh, jeez. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, so welcome. I always say he, he was my savior. <laughs> welcome to the show right there. Hey, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> now, you, you get, and and I have some old-time New York fans who remember that, Game two in 1993 of the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, and I know you, having been here for a year, you were more interested in the fact that it went from the lead went from three to five late in the game and helped the Knicks win. Mm-hmm. But the dunk, the dunk, it uh, was over pretty much over Horace Grant, but but Jordan yeah. kind of have a, he had a little observer status there as you went up <laughs> with that left hand. Yeah, um, it's funny because I tell people if that play happened in Chicago, it's just another play uh, because it yeah. happened in the Garden and against you know the Chicago Bulls and and Michael Jordan got in the picture and made it look good. It became uh, a sensation up here in New York and uh, I think around the country. So uh, it's funny because at that time I didn't think nothing of it. Uh, just another play, a play that had to happen for us to win the game and. It really wasn't until I came back and started working for the Knicks in 2004. And I can honestly say every day uh, since then, somebody asked me about <laughs> that play. It, it's just a, a special play. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to keep the tra- uh, tradition going to make sure you describe the, <laughs> the dunk for me. But I, but I do recall it right there. And, you know, I don't know necessarily that I, that I forgot that you used your left hand pretty well. Mm-hmm. But until I went back and watched that the other day, I thought, man, he did that with his left hand, and he did yeah. it like he did it like he does it all the time. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of right-handers, you know, dunk off two going right uh, pretty well. I'm more the opposite for whatever reason. I think because I got one leg longer than the other, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I just dunk better going off a of two with my left. And uh, it was just a perfect situation because Chicago liked to trap you on the baseline. And uh, B.J. Armstrong was pushing me that way, but he didn't realize that Bill Cartwright wasn't in position because he had his back uh, to him. And uh, when I saw that, I just hesitated and looked. And B.J. Armstrong was reading the play because he was looking at my eyes. And every time I cut my eyes, he knew a pick was coming. So I just cut my eyes early and I just, the baseline was wide open. I just took off and uh, just jumped with everything I had inside of me because, you know, I had Horace Grant coming, and he's 6'8", by 250, 260, and I knew I had to go in strong and uh, went in strong and dunked his spent out, ran up the court to get back on defense because Chicago like to catch you sleeping after a play like that. Mm-hmm. They called timeout. My teammates, you know, give me high five and what have you, and I'm saying go to the bench, and I'm sitting on the bench, and – and drinking water and trying to look up to catch a glimpse of the play while Riles was talking to her, uh, couldn't catch the play. And it wasn't until the next day where I saw in the paper who was on the back end of that play. And I 
he <laughs> he had a good look at it. Let's put it. He could have bought a ticket for that play right there because. Oh no question! I was a Bulls fan. Say you didn't dunk on him. You didn't dunk on him. I said, Well, I'm from Oklahoma. If you jump, try to block, you got dunked on too. <laughs> and they made po- <laughs> hey when they make posters about something like that, you yeah. know you know it's important. And certainly the Knicks fans can still remember that play right there. You know, a lot of people don't yeah, remember. Yeah. You ended up. Only, albeit what four or five games, but you actually played for the Bulls, right? Yeah, I, I played. Uh, I think one or two games with them, and uh, then I went in there and asked uh, for them to release me, and Jerry Krause wouldn't do it. No oh boy. And uh, <laughs> here we go with Jerry know, we Krause. Had, yeah. We had a, yeah, we had a little run in, so I, I can understand. You know, they dismayed with Jerry Krause because I had a little bit with him uh, at that time because you know. Uh, being a veteran player at that time, I was like 36, I believe now, 34. And, uh, you know, knowing that he wasn't going to keep me and uh, resign me at the end of the season, it was just uh, I had an expiring contract. So they just wanted the cap space. And normally what teams do for veteran guys when they bring them in is uh, they just release you, mm-hmm. you know, because they already got the cap space money. And, uh, I went in to ask him to release me. He wouldn't do it. Then I finally I got fed up. I said, well, why don't you just take my contract? And he was talking, well, well, now, what did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, why don't you just take my contract? He said, let me get back to you. Why don't you just go back to Tulsa? You just go on home and let me call the lead office and see if we can do that. And then he um, called me back. And said, yeah, we can do it. But it was one hour after you can sign with a team on a playoff roster. And I was like, why did you wait one hour to call me back when you could have released me earlier? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because I had already talked to Jeff Van Gundy to bring me back to the Knicks. But they were headed to the playoff. And he like, he didn't say much. And I said, no, well, I'm coming back. He said, no, you just stay there. We just seen your stuff. I was like, wow. Are you for real? And the next year, the next year, Greg Anthony got traded there. He released him right away. So he was just, you know, he was just being one of those guys that, for whatever reason, towards me, I'm not sure why, uh, that he, he just wanted to, like, stick it to me. So I think there's a million Jerry Krause stories out there that, that oh, people could no tell. Oh, no question. No hey, question. I mean, let me ask you, how do you uh, – how do you – how do you react to this new plan of the NBA coming back, you know, going to Florida, playing Disneyland? I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but I guess it's going to work, huh? Yeah, it's going to be crazy. It's almost like an AAU tournament. <laughs> where they're down in Disneyland and, you know, the AAU Nationals where everybody's there and playing tournament games and what have you. And the crazy part is that they have to be locked up for three months. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's going to be the crazy. I wonder how these guys are going to do it. You know what I mean? And how they're going to, you know, keep their sanity, knowing that they can't, you know, travel and they just have to be in, in uh, you know, Orlando for that uh, amount of time. And so uh, that's, uh, that's going to be interesting. You know, guys are going to get a chance to know each other uh, <laughs> quite well. And, you know, when you're, you know, going against each other, you, you want that – you know, that mentality that you dislike them. But, you know, you're going to be locked up, so you're going to spend, be spending some time with these guys. So it's the teams that can stay focused and and the superstars that can really, you know, uh, drive their teams and, and keep their teams focused because there's, there's going to be a lot of a lot of things going on down there and this that, that uh, teams that are not mature enough to handle it, don't, they're, going to, they're going to suffer. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy setup for sure, but at least they're getting back at it. Uh, yeah, let's let's go back to your college days, and and I know we t- we covered this on pre and post game interviews that we did when you were here. Uh, but when you, what kept you going through those junior college days? I mean, you 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 went to two or three, maybe three junior colleges, mm-hmm. and I think there's a period of time where. You might have thought, well, you know, this is not going to work out, and you had to go out and work a job. And then you know, we talked about Ken Tricky, of course, at, at the mm-hmm. Tulsa Junior College. But what what kept you going other than the fact you knew you could play the game? Well, just my love for the game is is one reason. You know, I always, you know, rather it's just playing street basketball or playing in these, uh, you know, leagues, 
uh, just to stay in shape. And uh, then really my wife, you know, once I got married and and uh, so I had to I had some maturing to do. I was very young and immature at the time, and uh, I really had some growing up to do. And when I got married and uh, had a my uh, son on the way, uh, so I had to you know some responsibilities in my life that I had to take care of. So I, I had to really uh, grow up and become a man quicker. And so uh, I think that's what kind of drove me uh, because, like I said, I had responsibility. I had mouths to feed, and so that made me work even even harder. This is always a tough question. Any one game or a couple that stick out in your mind, the, the, the only season you played here, Leonard Hamilton was the coach. And like we said, we had, a, we had an interesting roster of players, uh, to say mm-hmm. the least. But, you know, th- there was talent up and down that roster for sure. Oh, yeah. What, oh, yeah. what stands out as you look back all those years? Well, I, I think uh, I can remember a game where we was playing. I, I can't think of the kid's name, uh, but he played for the Washington uh, Wizards, uh, but he went to Louisiana, I want to say. Uh, he had one leg longer than the other. Oh, man, I can't think of that guy. But anyway, it was a game where we had the worst snowstorm, and so it was only about maybe 30 fans in the arena, it seemed like. And I can remember the team, you know, we were warming up and guys was clowning around, throwing the ball up, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. you got no fans in the arena except about 30, 30 fans. And I saw that, and I just stopped everybody and brought everybody together. And I told them to look up there. And it, it was this older gentleman who come to all our games. I said, I know it's not no, the crowd is not here, but that man came to see us play. So stop the BS <laughs> and let's get ready to go play basketball. And we end up winning that game because that team was favored over the uh, with the star player. I can't think of his name, but uh, we end up beating them. I had a great game. And ever since then, you know, I always think back on that. It's like, okay, because there's no one up here. That one uh, gentleman came to the every every last one of the game. He came to see us play. You should do your best, no matter who's in the stand. You should always do your best. What was it like playing for Hamilton? I mean, Leonard uh, Leonard was a, a fiery guy on the sideline, and uh, yeah, he was. To some extent, I think he was a player's coach, or whatever that means. I guess in a he general sense. Was. But uh, the guy you coach guys, was, he, he was he was interested because it was his second year, I believe, with, at Oklahoma State. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, uh, obviously, though, know, he's a talker <laughs> and a great recruiter, and uh, I think he was still just trying to get his foot feet wet uh, as far as, you know, uh, being a head coach. And so uh, we got along very well because uh, he just talked to me all the time. And uh, and I used to try to, like, pick his brain um, about, you know, guys that uh, he uh, coached when he was at Kentucky. You know, they had right. some great, great teams there. And just trying to get, you know, a little bit more information so I can – you know, become a much better player. And he's willing to, uh, you know, provide that information. And uh, he actually helped me when I turned pro, uh, you know, uh, put me with my first agent, Ryan Grinker. Uh, so I kind of used him as much as I could uh, for his knowledge of the game and 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 try to uh, get an understanding of what I need to do next at the pro level uh, because he had a wealth of knowledge. And uh, it's great to see what he's doing at Florida State. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's a little bit more laid back now than he was back then. And uh, But he's having a lot of success, so uh, I'm happy for Coach Han. Were you surprised when they, you got that call? Of I mean, course, Tricky called him, as I recall the story and remember the story. And uh, he sold uh, Hamilton on, on getting in touch with you. But were you, were you surprised when that connection came? Yeah, I, I was surprised. Uh, I remember Coach Seth coming down. I mm-hmm. think uh, Coach Brown, uh, who was my junior college, could last the not the last, but the junior college before uh, I went to Oklahoma Junior College with Coach Tricky. He was my coach, and then mm-hmm. he was uh, dean of students, I believe, over at uh, 
uh, at Oklahoma State when I got there. So he knew uh, me as a player, and uh, he he told me this story. We just had a Zoom call. Some of the uh, my former teammates at Northern, we all had a Zoom call with uh, Coach Brown, hmm. and uh, and he told me that they was going down to look at another player, and he was telling y'all looking at the wrong player. Y'all need to you know look at John Stark, and uh, they said John Stark who? <laughs> and when they went down, they came back. He came back and he told them that hey, he was right. <laughs> So I had a great game against the guy who they was talking about. I think he was playing against Eastern down there. And uh, and I had a great game. And ever since then, Coach Self, I used to see him at all the games uh, that he could be at. And I can remember him telling me um, that it was between me and another guy uh, at uh, Northern that they were looking at, too. And uh, I remember going up to Northern, and Coach Tricky said, who you want to guard? I said, I want to guard that guy right there. <laughs> and uh, I ended up shutting him down. I think he had like six points, and I had like 30, and they got off of him. And ever since then, they was on me. You know, uh, wrapping this up with uh, with John Starr, so we could go on for five hours just reminiscing. But uh, <laughs> you look at that, that coaching staff, I mean, not only Coach Ham, but uh, – you know, Self was an assistant there. Tim Carter, yeah. who I great respect for, was an assistant yeah. as well. Uh, that was a pretty good staff as well. Oh, great staff. You know, all great coaches. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we had a great time. Uh, Coach Self was, was my guy uh, when I got there. And so I kind of uh, looked at him and looked up to him uh, because obviously he was a player back in the day. And uh, it's very personal guy, as you know. Yes. And uh, just a lot of knowledge of the game. And so I kind of leaned on him, too, and I could lean on Coach, uh, Coach uh, Ham. Well, John, as always, we appreciate your time. And, uh, yeah, we, like I said, this could go on for two hours, but I think you've got a few more things yeah. you want to do before we, we do that. But I do appreciate you joining us. Uh, I can promise it's well. I hope it won't go thirty more years that we do this again. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I'll be a, I'll be around for thirty more years. <laughs> but uh, we enjoyed yeah. reminiscing a bit, and uh, I know a lot of people around here still follow what you're doing. And I do I do want to get yeah. into this too before we get out of here. You have a very important foundation that you're proud of, and you want to just tell people about it. Yeah, well, I started a foundation uh, back in '94 to provide scholarship to uh, high school students uh, in the New York and Tulsa area. And, uh, you know, we've been very successful and been going strong. You know, you hear about, you know, other athletes' foundations. I've just seen athletes' foundation come and go. But we've been very fortunate enough to uh, have an uh, incredible uh, young lady. I'm say she's young. She was probably like that. Jennifer Alfred, uh, mm-hmm. who's been running my foundation since 94 who's been doing a tremendous job and you know we couldn't do it without the, the sponsors that's been on board since day one and uh, we've been giving out scholarships uh, at 15 uh, a year a clip and so we've been doing that as well as we uh, continue to help them throughout their college uh, career as long as they continue to meet the grade point average and it's beautiful things because you know you see the students that they graduate they even doing the time that they go into college, they always come back and participate in our in our events that we do up in the New York area. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm very proud of that, that we'll be able to help uh, inspire a lot of students to go on and live out their dreams. Because I, I tell them all the time, it's like, you know, we once was students just like them. And, and I had to go the traditional route because I wasn't offered a scholarship. So I had to go the traditional route like a lot of these students do. Uh, to provide, you know, get financial aid and and try to uh, find a way to go to college. And so I just wanted to do my part because I was in position to uh, help. So uh, I'm extremely uh, uh, excited that we continue to go strong. I've been going strong uh, since 1994. Well, that, that is a great cause, and obviously a lot of uh, young men have benefited from that. Hey, John, I do appreciate anyway, your time. Is there something people could do yeah. to be part <laughs> of that? Get them. Could they, is there yeah. a way they could be part of this if, if they yeah, want to help? Yeah, you just go to the John Starks uh, Foundation.com. Okay, they can find it there, and all yeah. the instructions would be there, yeah, right? Yeah, they can find that, yeah, and uh, they can fill out uh, and apply for a scholarship. Okay, well, I like that idea. Hey, 
Great catching up with you, bud. And uh, we won't. Right, we'll do Tom. it again soon. I promise you. Yes, sir. And uh, best of luck to you, you and your family. Okay. All right. Same to you. Okay, John. You take see, care. see you, bud. Bye, bye. John Starks.